Uh, it's great to be here with you all today. Um, give you a little bit of my history, a 25 year software developer, then moved into advocacy, uh, now managing DevRel America's for GitHub. Um, and with that, a quick caveat that while a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is certainly general information. Uh, GitHub is the tool I work in most days, it's the one I know best. So I'm also gonna be providing some real specific advice on how to do specific things inside uh, the GitHub interface. So what I'm concerned about here, right, is, is how can we, when we expose a repository to the public, when we first make it, make it something that other people want to join in on, that people want to be a part of and want to contribute and share in, right? Uh, you know, hopefully I don't need to expand on the, the virtues of inner sourcing and open sourcing. We're all here for a reason and know that that's something that we want to do. So let's give you a little bit of how we can actually make that happen. So let's consider, starting out, how many developers are actually going to be working on your project, right? And uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to use the motif of gerbils. If you want to find out more about why I happen to pick that, uh, you can actually check out my blog post. Um, use the same motif, jh.io slash collab dash ready dash repo. It also contains a wealth of information and links that we won't have time to go into depth with here. So how many developers are we talking about? Start with one gerbil, right? A developer working alone in the room. That's how a lot of projects initially start out. That grows to two, three gerbils, and uh, they're going to collaborate on our project. The next obvious number after that, obviously, just thousands of gerbils, right? And this is our actual experience that we start out with a project. It's going along. It's just a few people involved, and then we inner source it or we open source it and suddenly dozens hundreds thousands of people are utilizing and contributing to and giving us bug reports and all of that so what do we know about these problems? first off one gerbil lonely now my daughter owns gerbils uh takes care of them and so i have a little bit of information about this one thing i can tell you is that one gerbil alone tends to kind of wither away they really need to live in pairs a uh, single gerbil some of them are okay but a lot of the time they basically end up dying of loneliness more or less they just don't thrive when they're individuals and this tends to be true of projects as well right an individual developer over time their enthusiasm may wane on the project or they may rabbit hole down on one particular thing they lack a way of bouncing ideas and getting inspiration from other people and they lack that sanity tech of other people both in terms of direction bugs that sort of stuff so the problems with the project, whether they're it being mistargeted or it's simply not behaving properly, those don't show up until the project actually hits production, which is the worst possible time. You want to catch those earlier. Two gerbils, two gerbils tend to work really well together. Uh, this is true of actual gerbils as well. It's also true of developers, right? We bounce ideas off of each other. We energize each other. We check each other's work. And in pairs, we tend to work pretty well naturally together without a huge amount of superstructure. We develop our own patterns that work well for that particular uh, couple of devs, and things tend to go along smoothly. Now, when you get a whole lot of gerbils in one place, that's when things tend to go awry. In fact, if you take a large number of gerbils, you put them into a cage, what actually happens is, unfortunately, they end up killing each other. Gerbils are very territorial creatures unless they perceive the other gerbils to be part of their in-group. So uh, you end up with not a good situation. Now with devs, similar. If you don't set up the right firewalls, if you don't have the right superstructure in place, all of those different opinions on how a project should go and where it should go and where the focus should be, and people occasionally working toward opposing goals ends up with all our problems and often a lot more coordinating than actually getting work done on the project. So to summarize that real quick, one gerbil bad, two gerbils good, mountain of gerbils probably dead, right? But knowing that we want to optimize for as many people as we can collaborating on our work, how can we actually get this mountain of gerbils to work together as smoothly as the pair, right? Now, when you're working with actual gerbils, what you do is you more or less set up a firewall. Uh, it's kind of like introducing cats if you've ever had to do that as you bring in new gerbils into the environment you initially set up a glass partition so they can see each other they can start to smell each other they can begin to interact and then over time that curiosity uh, leads to an ongoing relationship where they can work well and effectively and you can eventually remove those barriers similar situation with our indelible development environment so 
let's put that in place. Let's make sure we start by setting up our repository properly. Step one, what visibility are you going to consider? Now, personally, I tend to bias toward as public as possible. This provides more opportunities for collaboration. And also in the community, it builds a search first mindset so that people aren't constantly reinventing the wheel. Instead, they know that there's existing repositories out there that they can refer to, get inspiration from, use directly. And so our first instinct with enough public repos becomes, okay, go out, find the thing first, figure out how to incorporate or generalize it, uh, eventually give those generalizations back to the community, and we end up with a richer ecosystem and less duplication of work. Now, I tend toward open source first, truly really public, of course, in corporate environments, you often have to default down to internal, visible within your organization. Uh, last possible option, if you have to, go private, but bring in collaborators. There's actually a mechanism right inside GitHub, invite collaborators. The one thing you never want is a private repo with no other collaborators, because then if something goes awry, who takes over? Second thing to consider, what roles are you going to want to assign people by default? Now, I'm a big fan of assigning more write than read, right? I want people to be able to contribute, but I also want to acknowledge that incurs a certain amount of risks. We're going to address those in just a little bit. The other thing is, I'd say always make sure there's at least one other admin on the project, right? You don't want to go on vacation, get sick, uh, get hit by a bus and be in the hospital recovering and have to worry about whether or not something's going wrong with your repository and in ones that are step in. So find another trusted individual, assign them as an admin, even if their input is only occasional or emergency situations. Now let's talk about the content we actually want to put into this repository, right? First and foremost, you're reading. That's first contact for anybody coming into your repository. They're going to see right up front, ideally, your purpose, why they might want to use this particular project or contribute to it, and how they can do so. What you actually mechanically need to do to bring that tool down, start up the application, get things set up, etc. You might want a separate contributing marked out file which defines all of the fine details of how you want people to contribute, how you'd like folks to interact, what kind of issues they should raise, where it's most helpful for them to come in and put in the energy. A license file, of course, so people know what they're allowed to do with this repository and with the code and other con contents of it. Now, opinions vary a lot on this. This could be a whole discussion topic in and of itself. I'll simply say I tend to default toward MIT myself. And if you want further guidance on exactly what you want to choose, uh, there's a link right in that blog post. You can go directly to choose the license.com, I believe, uh, which will walk you through some of those options that you can have. Lastly, issue templates. So issue templates are great. Uh, inside GitHub, they're basically a definition of what your different forms people can use should look like when they're creating an issue or filing a bug. Because your objective here is you want to make it pretty streamlined and pretty fast for people to file a bug or bring up an issue. But you also want to have enough information in that that you don't have a whole lot of back and forth. So think about your issue templates, think about the minimum amount of information you need to collect to make sure you're not having to go back to that contributor five or 10 times to get clarification on things. All right, now I promised you I would talk about the risks involved in write but you know, overread. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of files here, right? First, code owners. Code owners is pretty critical. Uh, it helps to find the key parties who are going to manage your repository. And it's directly responsible for helping you address the risk implied by allowing write. To explain how this works, I need to dive a little bit into what we call the GitHub flow. So if you're not familiar with this yet, really brief explainer. By default, if you have write turned on, You've got your main branch of code, your primary set of files, and people coming in who want to contribute are going to be able to just drop a modification right onto that main branch, overwriting the older versions of files. Now, that can be a problem, of course, because what you have there is you have unbatched and unreviewed changes, and this leads to bugs, conflicts, confusion about what's going on. Instead, what we'd really like is for people to create what we call feature branch, a, a batch of changes, which collectively means something. It might be a, a feature 
uh, completion. It might have some other cohesive meaning, but that set of files that they're working on, we really want that batched up into a single, what we call pull request. You submit this pull request and it's shown to a set of reviewers who can then approve it or they can request that further changes be made. And then once everybody agrees that it's good to go, that's when that group of files is merged into the main branch and becomes part of the actual products you're creating. So in order to make this happen every single time, we need to set up something called a rule set in your repository. It's right in the settings of the repository in the rules section. And we can create a new rule set on any branch, but here what we're gonna do is create a rule set which applies to the default branch, the main branch. And there's two important options you wanna pick in there. First, check that box that says require a pull request before merging. That's what ensures that people can't commit directly to the main branch, but are at, instead asked, okay, can you create a pull request instead? And once you've checked that box, the software is gonna do it automatically for you for everyone who comes in. The second thing you wanna check is that require review from code owners option. What that does is, you might have guessed, it means it goes and it checks that code owner's file. And any pull request that comes through has to be approved by one or more people inside that code owner's definition. So that someone who really has familiarity with the project and is responsible ultimately for its management gets eyes on every change set before it actually goes into our main branch. So great, we've set it up. So every batch of changes needs to be reviewed. Uh, this makes it safer, but it also sounds like a lot of work, right? Are we gonna spend every waking moment pouring through every line of code that people submit, reformatting it, poking at the application to make sure it's still working properly? Ideally not. We want some way of automating a lot of those processes. Now, fortunately, GitHub has automation built right into every repository in the form of what we call GitHub Actions. There's a living library out there known as the GitHub Actions Marketplace, which has over 20,000 actions in it that you can just grab and utilize. And that library grows by several hundred every month. So here you can find tools like linters and testing frameworks. You can attach them to the repo as status checks. What do I mean by that? Looking back at our rule set, we can see that there's another section which allows us to require that selected status checks run on every pull request and block them from being merged if something fails. So now you can bring in those tests that need to run automatically. You can bring in your linters, all your other tools, and you can make sure that the automation is run and things are good to go before you finally go and click that manual approve PR. You have a summary of all the information that you need to know right up front. In addition, you can even write your own actions workflows and attach any abstract logic to your repo. And that information can be displayed in the PR page just as something you want to review, or it can even block merging also. So then we can do some really creative things. Uh, like one example, I have an action which runs in one of my repositories where there's a machine learning model. And so anytime a change occurs to the repository, which might affect the model, it goes, it runs an analysis on that model, it displays the output, the, the metrics and plots right in the pull request so reviewers can look at it quickly. And then if the accuracy drops enough, it's actually capable of going and blocking the merge so that it can't move forward until the model is patched back up. This is just one example. Obviously, there's an infinite number of possibilities here of what you could do. Also related to this, we want to make sure that all the contributions that we have are free of security vulnerabilities. So you can find a whole bunch of security tools out there in the actions marketplace, attach them to status checks, just as I just described. But you should also know that GitHub provides a bunch of native security capabilities that are built right in. So you might not go need to go and get a huge number of outside tooling for this. Uh, just to list them off very briefly, um, first off, Dependabot should be available in, in pretty much every repository you're working on. It notices if you add a package which has a known vulnerability. And when you do, it'll go and it'll suggest the best non-vulnerable 
version substitution. So usually it's just coming back to you and saying, hey, this particular dependency you added at this up to this next patch level to make sure that things are going to be sewn up and you're not adding vulnerabilities. Do more cool little tools that are in there. Um, secret scanning. Secret scanning is uh, an ability to go and look at for tokens that are added right in the raw code. Ideally, you're using a key manager or something like that. But if you screw up and you put a token right into the code, secret scanning is going to notice, detect, block that commit. Uh, and code scanning really goes into uh, heuristic patterns. So you do something like you accidentally add a vulnerable coding pattern like SQL injection or cross-site scripting potential into your application, code scanning is gonna notice that pattern and it's gonna alert you, let you know about it, let you know where in the code it's a problem and that you should probably fix it before you move forward. A quick side note, uh, those last two things are free for public repositories. If you're running private GitHub Enterprise versions, you may need to add the GitHub Advanced Security Package uh, to enable those. So it depends on your environment. All right. One more thing you probably want to consider as you set up, uh, which is code spaces, right? Uh, because one of the hardest things for a developer to do when they first come into a project is just go through that whole setup step. You know, often this is multi-hour i've seen everything from two hours to two days out there in the wild from when someone is introduced to a repo and pulls down the code to when they get through setting up all the environment variables uh disambiguating their virtual environment setting up the test processes in the background etc and it's usually like this brittle manual process that, that can have a lot of errors right what code spaces does is it provides your collaborators with this instant on reconfigured virtual programming environment right inside the repository. So they come on in, instead of pulling down the code, they have the option to just say, click open with code spaces. And it reads all the configuration details for the whole development environment right out of code inside the repository. Um, and then uh, it gives them within seconds, uh, a full blown IDE operating on a cloud programming environment where they can just start working got live code there, they can see their changes in real time, and they very quickly move into understanding and contributing back to the project because it is so low friction. And it also, as an added bonus, lets them and you work from anywhere on any device and have a consistent environment across all of your contributors. So there's no more of that sort of, it works on my machine, but it doesn't work on yours. Let's figure out the exact configuration problem. All those issues go away. All right, so that's it. You're done, except you're not. You've paved this well-lit path and you know responsibly set up everything that contributors need to come in, but for it to live and be a good project, you then also need to commit to being responsive in the future. So automation is gonna handle a lot, yes, but you're still gonna need to watch for bug reports, responds to visitors' questions, handle those edge cases that your automation doesn't catch, adjust your settings and policies and workflows if things start to go awry. If you're proactive on those and you respond quickly, then things tend to go very smoothly because it catches all of the downstream potential problems that you've just patched up. And of course, most importantly, make sure that you also celebrate people's contributions and their successes as they work with your projects. You really want to create this warm, welcoming, positive experience for everyone who comes in and interacts with your project so that they want to do more and so that you're creating great things for the community. So thanks for coming this far with me. I know we're going to want to do a little Q&A. Um, if you want to dig deeper, though, I want to drop these last two links on. First off, um, gh.io slash collab dash ready dash repo. That's the longer form blog post that describes a lot of this. It's got tons of links in it, places you can go deeper, things we haven't had a chance to get in depth with today. Uh, the other thing I want to announce, and this is just recent, right? Um, thanks to the suggestion actually of another Inner Source Commons member, um, we've built out this checklist of all the things you want to consider doing in your when you're creating a repository, and we've released that as an issue template. So 
uh, you go to that repository, JHIO collab ready template, um, and you're going to see an open source repo. You can copy just the issue template out, or you can clone the whole thing if you're starting a new project. Um, and that gives you an issue template where you can fire up an issue and have a checklist of all the things you need to do, take notes on what license you pick, that sort of thing. And then you can iterate over that as you develop your project and go back and do the more complex things, check them off and have a record of all the things you've done to really ensure that your repository is ready for collaboration. All right, with that, I'll stop talking and uh, find out whether or not we have any questions that I can help answer.